Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker today, uh, Dan Juras, who is um, visiting us from virtually from Stanford University. Um, I'm especially excited to invite Dan as someone who myself is connected to both EEB and MCDB departments. His work kind of shares that bridge and, and it was wonderful to see his kind of individual visit schedule populated by members of both departments and I see them both um, members from both groups in the department in the audience here today is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so I think his work, as we'll see, really does nicely kind of bridge that that um, those two disciplines, those two areas of, of biology, and we'll hopefully sort of talk about the, the connections among them a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, Dan is an associate professor at Stanford University and where he's in the chemical and systems biology as well as developmental biology departments. Dan Hearn earned his PhD from MIT in biochemistry where he was studying low fidelity DNA polymerase and its links to cancer and other diseases. He then went on to do postdoctoral work at the Whitehead Institute, where he was supported by a Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation Fellowship, which is near to my own heart, because that's how, what got me through postdoc as well, um, where he studied HSP90 chaperone proteins. And for those of you that don't know, these are proteins that help other proteins uh, fold properly. And in doing so, they can actually allow genetic variation to kind of be maintained within a population because they can help the protein fold properly despite um, genetic variation. So in 2013, he uh, started his faculty position at Stanford with the long-term goals of understanding the mechanisms of both stasis, how things stay the same, and change, how they become different at, at different time scales. Um, I'll read this next blurb exactly from his, his official Stanford bio, because I think it distills a lot of impressive accomplishments into a short phrase. Um, it says the Jerez Lab employs multidisciplinary approaches ranging from chemical biology to systems level quantitative genetics and uses models as diverse as baker's yeast and the African turquoise killifish. Dan has been named an NIH new innovator and has received awards from the Searle, Glenn, Packard, Kimmel, and Valley Foundations, but is proudest of the Louis, um, Louis Pasteur Prize from the Belgian Brewing Society. <laughs> so it's good to have you know, priorities in order. Um, so with that, Dan, thank you again for spending your time with us, visiting with people throughout the day and presenting this seminar. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. Um, can folks hear me? Let's see the screen. Great. Okay. So life uh, is tough, right? And of course, um, you know, we know this ourselves. Uh, and you know, for this tree, it's very challenging. But I mean tough in both senses of the word, because also, Life is extraordinarily resilient, right? As you can see in this image. And we see evidence for that in a variety of paradoxes that captivate our imagination as biologists. And I wanna focus on the third of these listed here today, um, which is you know, that for better or worse, you look very similar to your parents, right? Because of many mechanisms that ensure the faithful transmission of genetic information across generations. And yet we also know that uh, Successful evolution requires um, making new heritable traits, right? So, how do you balance um, these competing needs for stasis and changes? Um, Trisha mentioned. So, if you turn to evolution, you can see examples kind of on both ends of the spectrum. So, on the one hand, we have organisms that we call living fossils, right? That look very similar to their ancestors from uh, tens of millions of years ago. And on the other end uh, of the spectrum, we can see examples of extraordinarily rapid uh, evolutionary change. Um, and often, uh, especially clinically, these can have devastating consequences for, for human health. So as we've thought about um, mechanisms that might be involved in um, regulating this, this process, um, we have you know, kind of bin them in, in two major categories. So you know, one of them is uh, to do more with variation you already have. That's what I'll talk about in the first part uh, of our time together. And the other would be to generate new heritable variation. Um, and in my PhD work, I thought a lot about how this is done uh, in the production of new mutations uh, in stressful environments. But uh, I'll tell you in the last part of our time together um, about an epigenetic mechanism that is actually quite pervasive, but has been hidden in plain sight um, because it's invisible to many of our next technologies. Okay, so I live in a, a systems biology department that would like to uh, have this level of understanding of genotype to phenotype relationships to really quantify all of the interconnected regulatory circuitry um, that um, gives rise uh, to biological traits. Uh, and 
I would argue that uh, in order to do this properly, we need to understand how that circuitry changes in, in response to changing environments. And um, in particular, we need to pay attention to the fact that these aren't just abstractions, all the nodes in this network, but rather they are composed um, of molecules. And most molecules uh, of life are made as long linear polymers that need to fold up into complicated three-dimensional shapes to exert their function. And this is uh, especially true for proteins. And of course, we know from the work of Anthonson that all the information required to get to the final fold uh, is present in the uh, primary sequence. And you know, these folds can be extraordinarily complex right, uh, in ways that are linked to their function. But there is a, a critical difficulty that uh, you know, happens in, in real life that uh, was not true in Anthonson's test tube. And that is that these confirmations need to be achieved in a very crowded intracellular environment. Um, and yeah, I don't know if any of you have ever made protein at the concentration that uh, it, it is in the um, cytosol, for example, a couple hundred milligrams per mil. It's really a, a very crowded, almost egg white like uh, uh, solution. Okay, so the, the problem is actually amplified further um, by the fact that many proteins are relatively unstable. And this is particularly true for uh, proteins that regulate information transfer. And um, you know, this is work for many people, but principally um, Fran Arnold showed that uh, this stability is really a, a, a key threshold for determining whether mutations can have a consequence. Okay? So um, you know, most or many proteins are folding with an average delta G that isn't very large. And what that means is that they're only a couple of mutations away uh, from being unfolded and unable to participate uh, in driving the phenotype. So this kind of problem that you know, life is living at the precipice of protein instability um, you know, is true from bacteria to humans. And um, you know, organisms deal with it largely in the same way. They have a cohort of proteins that we call chaperones that help other proteins acquire the right fold. And um, in fact, if organisms face a proteotoxic stress, uh, they stop making the vast complement of their proteome and shift to translating um, this altered uh, set of, of proteins that individually and, and collaboratively help unfolded proteins achieve uh, their proper confirmations. Um, and yeah, I want to focus on one of these um, that is you know, really fascinating uh, for the reason that Trisha mentioned. It has a relationship to underlying genetic variation. And uh, you know, like many discoveries, this was made totally accidentally. Um, by, uh, to, the first findings were from Len Neckers um, at NIH, who you know, used the kind of flexible funding they have to spend 18 months um, looking at uh, the transforming activity of VSARC, one of the first oncogenes ever um, reported. And um, you, know, you can look at that in this colony forming assay. And what he, he found was that uh, you know, there were compounds he could add that would block the capacity of the oncogene to transform the cells. Uh, you know, it turns out that those were inhibitors of this chaperone, HSP9, um, and that uh, you know, the way it's working is that the same mutations that activate the oncogene destabilize the folds. So it's a, a difference in the melting temperature of about eight degrees. And um, because of that, if the chaperone wasn't around, uh, you wouldn't have an effect um, of those mutations. So when you inhibit chaperone function, you uh, block the capacity of the oncogene to turn the normal cell into a cancer cell. But on top of that, uh, I think conceptually, hopefully you can appreciate that you know, those mutations have a phenotype that is licensed by the activity of the chaperone. And as I just showed you on the last slide, the activity of that chaperone is regulated by environmental stress. So this provides a, a mechanism through which the environment can impact right, what uh, variants, uh, genetic variants, give rise to phenotype. And it, it turns out that that's true for many uh, mutations associated with, with cancer, um, but also for natural variation that's present in populations. And work um, over quite a number of years in organisms you know, ranging from plants to flies uh, to fish and um, even yeast have suggested right, that this uh, you know, was pervasive um, in nature. Um, but, you know, and when I started my, my postdoc, I wanted to try to understand what the variants were, right? because uh, you know, none of the, the mapping studies 
got us to a very good resolution. And as uh, you know, Trisha mentioned, I trained as a, effectively a chemist. And uh, I was very naive about you know, how you might do this. Uh, but I you know, came up with a, a cross design and I thought, okay, we'll um, look, you know, starting in yeast or this might be you know, easier than in some other organisms. We'll make you know, F1s, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, genotype them and, and phenotype them and you know, correlate in the genotype phenotype map. And of course, the, the problem with this in, in all organisms and you know, even in, in yeast when we started was that uh, the Bayesian confidence intervals for the linkage uh, that you find encompasses many, many genes, right? And uh, many of them are polymorphic, and many of those are non-synonymous changes. And in fact, there are many of them occur in, in known substrates of HSP90. And there's no way to, to know which ones matter, right? Except that you know, the advantage of yeast is that we could go through and replace little parts of this interval bit by bit Right, until we found, unfortunately, actually in this order, that um, this particular trait was driven by this kind of S1 gene. Um, we could reconstruct everything. It had a logical connection based on its activity to the phenotype we were examining. Um, and I did this for four more variants. It got me a paper that you know, probably got me my job. But I have to say, when I, I started my lab, I had absolutely no enthusiasm for telling a student um, to work on this problem because it was so laborious, even in yeast, to um, get to this point, you were never going to be able to have enough uh, you know, examples to get to true statistical power. And you know, of course, this linkage problem um, hasn't always been a problem, right? It's allowed people like you know, Mary Claire King to uh, map alleles involved in, in human disease, um, but it's a curse for most phenotypes, right? Which are very often driven by many variants um, of small effect. And um, that you know, they, uh, the, causal, the causal mutations um, are commonly inherited with pass adjacent passengers. Sorry, I'm losing the. Um, and you know, how do you know which ones matter, right? That's uh, you know, always tough. Uh, and the, the, uh, the old deck there. Uh, and you know, really, the, the reality is that we make an educated guess, right? There's nothing statistically to distinguish a causal variant that matters from one nearby that, that doesn't. And so we, we wondered if we might be able to break this log jam. And we started by making models, uh, quantitative models, to look at you know, the relationship between the combination rating and genome length and you know, see if it might be possible experimentally to push this, this boundary. And um, you know, of course, yeast turns out to be an ideal place to do this, actually other fungi, just because of the large number of crossovers um, in meiosis relative to genome size. And social insects would also be a, a good spot. Um, but many of the workforce laboratory organisms, unfortunately, have very few crossovers relative to the size of their genomes. OK, so um, yeah, I'm sure you've heard members of your department evangelizing to the awesome power of yeast. Um, you know, the reality is we can control every aspect of its life cycle, and we do many generations of iterative inbreeding. And what this does is basically allow you to separate each site of variation from its neighbors um, through, again, repeated crossovers. And then we play another trick, which is we can take um, these, you know, more than a thousand um, genotype progeny and um, make diploids of them in various ways. Uh, so that we know exactly what the um, uh, sequence of the diploid is. And this gives us uh, a panel where we have many more individuals than sites of variation. And it lets us get to single nucleotide resolution from the beginning. Okay. And then of course we can use, again, the power of um, robotic technology uh, to, to phenotype very rapidly in this organism. The data um, you know, look sort of like this. Sorry, uh, delay again. Um, but we can get, again, mil you know, millions of, of measurements in a relatively short amount of time. And um, all of these for this. There we go. Okay, you get data that, like this. We can uh, get a very nice uh, replication and then um, go ahead and begin the mapping. Okay. So uh, yeah, here's what it looks like um, on the y axis uh, is a metric of the likelihood that a given locus marching along the x axis is involved in variation in phenotype. And we started just by looking at resistance to antifungal drugs that are used both clinically, but also broadcast into to fields in, in agriculture. And you know, these peaks look pretty good. Um, but when you zoom in, you start to see 
the dirty laundry here again. So the teal is um, what you get um, just from basic mapping. And yeah, you know, I think you, you happen to know that this trait comes from variation in PC2. And maybe you could believe that that is you know, right at the top. But I, again, I have to say, I wouldn't want to spend six months on molecular biology just, just on this. But what's really nice, um, or which is, like, I should say first, it's even worse um, when you zoom in to UPC2, you see the problem here, that there are many variants. And it's, you know, usually you would look at uh, which ones have the most perturbative uh, mutation. And you might predict it would be this EDK allele uh, at position 532. But what's nice, again, about having more sites uh, or fewer sets of variation than individuals in the cross is that you know, we don't have to make those sort of guesses. Um, these allele replacements already happened um, in, the, in the cross. Okay? So you can see sign flips unambiguously um, when you replace one variant um, with the other. And you know, we use this to formalize a new statistic that we call a QTN score. And it gives you really digital resolution for which um, nucleotides matter. And it also revealed a surprise and that was that actually the variant that mattered for UPC2 wasn't this E to K uh, variant, but rather a synonymous variant at the five prime and sorry, the three prime end of the or. Um, so these are exactly the kind of variants that we're told to ignore that we use as a denominator, for example, in a DMBS. And you know, we use this to identify thousands of causal nucleotides across dozens of traits. We've compared sort of how the, the, the genetics that nature uses, right? Um, compares to the results from genetics that we do as, as human beings, where we um, delete genes in their entirety or we express them. And um, it's interesting to see kind of the types of, of variation that, that we observe. The, the nodes that overlap in these networks as we construct, construct them tend to be um, the sort of hubs in, in the networks, whereas um, the, you know, the ones that, that don't, that we see that are unique um, in the natural variants, tend to be more at the edge. I think it's interesting to look in a couple of cases that you know, we've gone into, it, you know, very often we see that the natural variants don't mess with the sort of core of the metabolic or regulatory pathway, but rather with ways of um, tinkering with like, interactors at the edge. Yeah, you know, the, the resolution allows us to get biochemical understanding, right? You can see cases in which, for example, the um, resistance to drugs that we mapped came from um, modeling of hydrogen bonding networks that reposition key contact determinants within active sites. Um, and you know, we even see other properties uh, that, at a, a larger scale. So for example, um, it, you know, we often think about uh, shared functions, you know, having a, a spatial organization in, in prokaryotic genomes, but in eukaryotic genomes, we really we don't. But what we found was that variants that affected the same trait were very likely to be found near in space. So um, not in the, the same gene, but you know, nearby. And you know, I think it's uh, interesting to think about what this means in terms of uh, the, the inheritance um, through meiosis of, of phenotype, right? So it sort of ensures that uh, if you have a polygenic trait, it's very likely that um, those variants will be uh, inherited together. So I think it's provocative, um, given that you know we often, particularly in my uh, developmental biology uh, yeah, uh, lunches, we we talk about whether uh, variants in, in cis or trans um, matter, or particularly whether you know, sort of coding variants versus regulatory variants matter more. Um, and yeah, this is a case where we can explain you know more than ninety percent of the heritability of the traits we mapped, um, and can basically resolve all linear contributors to, to phenotype. And basically, you know, even in an organism like yeast that you know, has a very small um, regulatory sequence relative to, to others um, that you know, people might think about, we can't find traits that are driven exclusively by one or the other. Everything is a composite of many types of, of variation. And if we look at the effect size um, of those variants we map, um, you know, the, the surprise of that uh, UPC2 example turns out to be general. So you know, very often we find that synonymous variants are an important contributor to the phenotypes we mapped. And moreover, their effect sizes are comparable to those of uh, non-synonymous mutations. Okay? So this is not at all what would happen if you did a deep mutational scan of an enzyme, let's say. 
Um, but you know, it's saying something about the filter of selection, uh, you know, having preserved synonymous variants that, that have a, a large impact. And you know, perhaps we should have uh, you know, suggested or anticipated this a little bit um, because of a, a structure in the codon table. So you know, if you look in the triplet code, the identity of the amino acid is encoded in the first two nucleotides. But it turns out that uh, and, and the wobble of uh, the third nucleotide gives you uh, the efficiency, if you will. And it turns out that actually um, in every genome, there is a preference for which wobble uh, nucleotide uh, correlates with being a, a good codon, an efficient codon, and which one correlates with being a, a, a bad one. And it's sort of related to GC content in the genome. And what this means is that when you um, perturb identity, so one of the first two nucleotides, you tend to keep codon optimality the same. Um, and by contrast, if you perturb uh, or mutate the third nucleotide, the wobble, you tend to uh, you know, change the efficiency a lot, but you keep identity the same. Um, and so we just um, permuted this for a having distance of, of one within the codon table here. And uh, you, know, you can see that uh, for synonymous mutations, uh, you have a much broader distribution in orange than you do for missense mutations uh, in gray. It, it turns out that this is uh, actually you know, less pronounced in yeast than it is in many others of the, um, the organisms that we've examined, so we looked at a thousand different genomes. So just to uh, you know, recap this, missense mutations tend to preserve an adaptation index, whereas synonymous mutations don't. Um, and we see the same effect uh, across you know, many, many genomes that we've examined. And it's interesting that um, those that, that matter seem to be enriched at the five prime end of ORFs in a region that uh, corresponds to some hypotheses about translational uh, ramping that have been uh, advanced by Saki Popo. And we've seen that, that many can alter protein levels. Um, they can also impact uh, RNA stability and, and even folding. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's going to be very exciting to understand all of these mechanisms in the future. But yeah, I want to you know, try to you know, open, you know, hopefully you'll be open to the idea of thinking about uh, at least some synonymous variants as a type of regulatory variant that can arise within an open reading frame. Um, and at a bare minimum, I think it's unwise for us to ignore them as a standard practice, um, again, in, in our field as evolutionary biologists, but also um, in the clinical genetics where you know, these aren't even considered at all. Okay, so um, going forward with this, we'd like to you know, understand really fundamental and you know, classic concepts, right, in, in heredity, um, but you know, now uh, be able to look at them at uh, a resolution that lets us understand molecular mechanism in a way that wasn't previously possible. And I just um, show you one example here. So this is um, looking at a, a just a course-directed graph of uh, many of the data uh, points that we've taken. And uh, looking at pleiotropy. So, you know, here again, each uh, node is a variant. The size indicates um, the number of uh, conditions in which that variant matters. And then the edges between the nodes um, tell you about a, a shared um, condition in which the, the variants each have an effect. And yeah, I, I show you ju this just to look at you know some of the the very biggest um, nodes here. So these are uh, you know, variants that are affecting a large number of phenotypes. And it turns out um, that they very often are a totally different type of, of variation than we usually think matters. Um, so yeah, I, when I trained as a biochemist, I was told that when you, know, you do alignments like this um, and see gapped regions that didn't look super conserved, that those were exactly the parts of proteins that didn't matter. And yeah, the, the beauty of the resolution we have here is that we can um, say unambiguously, that uh, in fact, they do, they are uh, having the largest effect on, on phenotype in some ways of the content. Um, and yeah, I, it turns out that these types of um, domains, this what we call disordered domains, um, are extraordinarily common um, in you know, all proteins, but especially in, in eukaryotic proteins. Um, and you know, again, for the remainder of our time together, I'll talk about some of the um, unusual things that, that they can do. Um, that I think we've been pretty blind to um, today. So, you know, we're, we're used to, you know, in fact, when I lecture, uh, you know, drawing a protein like this uh, domain on the left, right? It has uh, beta sheets, that has uh, alpha helices, and is well folded. 
Yeah, in us, about 30% of our proteins are appended with uh, often very long regions that don't conform to a fixed structure and solution. And we call these intrinsically disordered regions. Um, if you know, you're a biochemist, you know, the first thing that I did uh, was to remove them and because they do all kinds of terrible things to your protein yields, uh, they can cause aggregation. Um, but it, and usually you can ascribe the known activity uh, of the, the protein to the ordered domain. So yeah, it makes sense here. But uh, in fact, they can drive a you know, really paradigm shifting mode of, of biology. Um, and you know, that is uh, something that we think of you know, in you know, its basic sense as, as a prion. Um, and I'll try to convince you that we should broaden our concept of, of what that is. So you know, this is a, an age old problem that um, you know, captivated the attention of uh, farmers, of veterinarians, um, and molecular biologists right, for um, almost a century. And yeah, you know, the story begins with this sheep that's sick with a disease called scraping. And that um, isn't something that came from a, a, a virus or a, a pathogen, um, but rather came from an endogenous protein that underwent a change in its conformation that turned out to be infectious. Okay? Um, and of course, this you know, captivated the imagination of, of many people uh, and wound up you know, getting a, a Nobel Prize for, for Stan Kuzma. Um, but you know, we see many examples, in fact, of this kind of behavior um, in nature. And it's one of the most vivid uh, you know, can be seen on these two plates of yeast, but are genetically identical in every way that we can discern. And yet something is obviously very different. Um, and what's different is that the uh, cells that give rise to the white colonies have a, a different proteome. Uh, but it's not different in a way that we can detect uh, if we just did a, a mass spec experiment. What they've done actually is to reorganize one protein into aggregates. And you can see that if you tag the you know, C-terminus of that protein with GFP in the red cells, totally diffused, and in white cells, it, it goes to these plankton. And it turns out that that's not some sort of like amorphous um, schmutz in the, the cells, but, but rather um, it's composed of, of fibers um, that, in fact, you can make uh, in vitro with the, the purified protein. And there's this beautiful cross beta sheet structure that you know is amyloid. And in particular, this protein has a, a property a chemical property that allows it to transmit information. So if you just take some purified protein and watch it assemble over time, you see a, a lag phase and then an assembly phase. But if you take some of the protein from the end of that reaction and use it to seed a new round, in assembly, you see something totally different. Right? So you see a, a burst and that comes from the faithful self-templating of the aggregates um, onto oncoming monomers, right? so it's, it's the growing of the, the fiber. And that's really it, right? This is the, the fundamental biochemical property that allows this protein whole to transmit information. It's more complicated than that in cells. So you have this growing fiber and that's actually gonna be kept in the mother um, by active mechanisms and also because it's very, very large. Um, and so that has to be actually fragmented into smaller pieces that we call seeds um, that are then broadcast to daughter cells. And um, there they launch new rounds of replication. And if you think about it, right, that's really the replicon, right, the, is, is the seed. And it really, it's this whole process of growth, fragmentation, and um, propagation to the next generation that is you know, creating a, a cycle of replication that outlives the half lives of the molecules that encode it. Right? And that's what allows us to uh, actually persist over a very long biological time scale. So, because the aggregate um, isn't attached to a chromatin, right? it's not like an allele of a gene. Um, they have very unusual patterns of inheritance. So uh, they are mitotically stable um, and uh, they are also dominant. And again, um, they don't segregate with genetic information. So they are actually passed to all meiotic progeny um, defying members' lots. Okay? Um, and yeah, they're really fascinating. They're kind of, you know, on the one hand, very heritable, on the other hand, um, reversible. So um, because uh, of their strong reliance on chaperone proteins to catalyze that fragmentation, if you inhibit chaperone activity, even transiently, 
uh, you wind up basically keeping a large aggregate in mother cells and daughters don't inherit those replicons, the seeds, and the trait is eliminated. So it sort of has um, the features of stable genetic inheritance, but also can be very labile. So yeah, again, this was studied for some time. People saw it as paradigm shifting, but relatively rare and driven always by Romero. But in my postdoc, um, we you know, I began to you know, study this other trait that um, you know, led me to, to question some of these uh, uh, underlying assumptions. So what we were looking at was um, metabolite repression in yeast, which you know, is very stringent. Right? So we've domesticated this organism because it is prodigious at turning glucose into ethanol. And um, you, know, you can play tricks on it by uh, using the memetics of glucose, like glucosamine shown here, that you know, it, it senses as uh, the glucose sugar, but uh, that it can't metabolize. So, um, you see an example of this here. So yeast can grow just fine on uh, glycerol as a carbon source ordinarily. But if you add a small amount of glucosamine to that media, the cells arrest and they do not grow. They're not dead, but they're waiting. Um, they've turned on a transcriptional program that favors growth uh, on glucose and you know, there's none there, right? They're not gonna be able to survive. So a, a lab in, in Canada um, was using this strategy to try to map mutants involved in metabolite repression. And they found that at a uh, you know, frequency of about one in 10,000 cells, you could get uh, colonies that were able to, to repress this. Uh, and they thought they had found the mutants, but they noticed problems. So uh, they saw the same frequency in haploids and diploids, that shouldn't happen uh, because many mutations are recessive. They saw that the uh, variants didn't follow Mendel's laws when they tried to uh, segregate them meiotically. And uh, yeah, they, they thought maybe it could be mitochondrial mutation. They had a follow-up paper showing that wasn't it. And like many people, they, they dropped the, the line of research because there were you know, other things that, that they could do and this just didn't make sense. Um, and we now know that the reason it didn't make sense is because this is a prion trait um, that we call GAR for its capacity to reverse glucose associated repression. And you know, the, the biology of this event is fascinating. The switching frequency varies with uh, carbon source fluctuations in the niches from which um, wild strains are derived, for example. Um, and it can be induced by interaction with bacteria. So this happened um, in serendipitously through contamination of a, a plate. Um, but you can see the phenomenon here. So, um, it turns out that uh, if you will spot, these are, are staph hominis, but many bacteria do this, uh, bacteria adjacent to cells that are naive, right, and cells that harbor the freon, again, they have exactly the same genome. But um, what you can see is that when the bacteria are there, the adjacent yeast uh, acquire the capacity to grow. And that is stable when they uh, remove the bacteria and keep propagating. Um, and other bacterial species turn out to do this. It provides benefits um, in fact to both organisms. You can see it in long-term co-culture experiments. And this property has been um, conserved actually over a very long um, distance. So the glucose repression of this type has re-evolved a couple of times in the um, fungal lineage. And you know, in each case, uh, the interaction with uh, bacteria from the uh, niche of the, the organism gives rise to this um, uh, state switch. So, you know, in the end, this is a kind of a bizarre example of a behavior that's almost quasi-remarking, right? Um, where exposure to a, a shift in the environment, um, it, you know, induces an adaptive change in phenotype that turns out to be terrible. Um, so we're very interested in it, understanding the, the mechanism, um, but it turned out that it didn't involve amyloid conversion. and you know, for a long time, I thought that was because the protein was stuck in the membrane um, and just it wasn't sterically possible. But it turns out that you know, the, the way we identify um, this kind of, of protein aggregation you know, is pretty primitive. And uh, yeah, even something like the, the true prion protein is actually a poor score in algorithms you use to do that computationally. And you know, although the types of domains that we think about as driving this kind of aggregation are um, certainly out there in proteomes. They're, they're relatively rare in metazoan proteomes. And it, it made us wonder if there are other ways um, to participate in this, or drive this kind of biology. 
So we um, turn to the fundamental biophysical feature of these um, folding landscapes to try to address this question. And that is that the self-templating aggregation, the one that's uh, infectious or inheritable, um, is, tends to be more stable than the native fold. Um, however, it's kinetically isolated, so you don't usually get there on a, a normal biological time scale. But if you make more protein, you increase the likelihood that that will happen. And because each cell is sort of bounded, basically you will convert all protein in the cell into the self-templating fold, and that should be stable over the good many years in, in, in bother cell time. So, yeah, in yeast, we can do anything that, that we want. Um, so we took uh, the entire orchion and we transiently overexpressed each open immune frame individually um, in quadruplicates. And we did it in small population sizes to try to avoid mutations. And then we ask 100 generations later, after all of that original protein is dead and gone, even assuming an infinite half-life, after we get rid of the plasmid, do we see a record of that past overexpression? So um, we look just for a difference in growth. Here. And then if we see one, we ask if it has those unusual inheritance properties that we ascribe to before. So it, does it define Mendel's laws and genetic laws? And um, if we transiently inhibit a chaperone function uh, that we think is involved in uh, fragmentation to make those replicons, uh, can we permanently eliminate the traits? Okay. So these are things you would never expect for a normal mutation, for example. And in doing so, we found dozens of new uh, prion-like elements. And uh, what was fascinating is, you know, they mostly um, looked like bar rather than like uh, the, the others about which we knew previously. So almost all of them are proteins with large intrinsically disordered regions. Interestingly, they're not especially low complexity, um, but those regions are present in orthologs from fungi to humans where they exist. The traits that we found uh, were mostly beneficial. And of course, there's a bias in the screen to uncover such a thing. But we also found some detrimental traits. So I think uh, so it's an interesting thing to comment on. And most of them did not form amyloid fibers. And I'll show you in a minute um, what they do instead. So we found it provocative, given that we think of prions as subverting the central dogma, that almost all of these um, elements interface with earlier stages of information decoding. And they do fascinating things. For example, um, controlling whether double-stranded breaks are resolved as crossovers in meiosis or not, or um, whether subtelomeric regions are uh, activated or, or repressed. You see many um, cases in which the formation of um, these um, self-templating entities change transcriptional networks, and quite a number where um, they are controlling the um, stability of, of the transcription. I just would point out that um, you know, it's not just stochastic aggregation, um, and this was a big surprise to you, but rather you know, it very often is, is regulated um, akin to what we just saw for, for GAR. Um, you know, we see that you know, precise events, for example, a prolonged cell cycle arrest can lead to induction of these elements from uh, one in 10,000, one in 100,000 frequency to basically occurring in all cells. Um, and again, you don't have to time to, to go into all of it, but um, try to make uh, new tools to ask whether they've been subject to selection and some evidence like that um, may be true. But I want to focus on these last two points um, for the remainder of our, our time together. So I think these elements are, are pervasive and they have important functional effects that we've been blind to. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, one of these that we call SMOG that enacts a, a regulatory switch in post-transcriptional gene control. And uh, yeah, it would be remiss if not uh, plugging the, your new colleague. So uh, this is Anupam Chakrabarty, who is a postdoc uh, with me and just started uh, initially. And so we should all seek him out. Um, he did all of this work and it really was, uh, as you'll see, uh, quite exciting. So you know, RNA binding proteins control every uh, message in the cell. Right? And yet um, we know relatively little about uh, what they do and sort of how specificity is determined. Um, you know, the key roles in development, they're mutated very often in human um, disease and overexpressed, in fact, often in cancers. Um, but we know less about them than transcription factors. And uh, they very often have domain architectures like this. So very small RNA binding domains to which function has been described. And then large disorder sequences 
that have been preserved over time as uh, disordered sequences, um, but that we really don't know 100% of what they do. So, you know, as you may be aware, uh, in the past several years, it's uh, been you know, proposed that one function of these types of, of regions is to drive a process known as phase separation or liquid liquid phase separation. And this we think of as, as pretty dynamic. Others of them um, can promote aggregation, which we think of as more of a, a permanent uh, uh, state. And indeed, you know, you, there's some evidence you can transition from the liquid state to the solid state, but we don't think that uh, going back being possible. So smog, which is known actually as VTS1 in use, but smog in other organisms, so I'm just going to call it that, um, you know, is no different from all of these. It has 90% of the, the protein is, is disorder. Um, and this domain architecture has been preserved from yeast to us. Um, and yeah, it's a very important protein. So you know, early on in development, right, uh, you rely on uh, RNAs that are deposited from mom, but eventually you have to uh, turn them over, right, so that you can uh, have cellular transcription. And uh, this protein is what is driving that, that process. So it binds to stem loops and messages and then recruits a duodenalist machinery that chews up the poly A tail and destabilizes the message. But most studies um, biochemically have looked really just at the very small order part of the protein. So Anapan wanted to see what uh, the whole thing does, and um, in particular, whether he could get uh, you know, the, the prion to propagate really just in vitro. So he spent a lot of time carefully purifying the, the whole thing, and then he tagged it with a fluorophore, a red fluorophore. And then he seeded uh, that purified protein with small amounts of lysates from cells, again, with the same genome, but that have a different state of the protein to begin with. And what he found was that when he seeded with lysates from wild type, uh, you could get aggregation very clearly. And from uh, the naive uh, wild type as well, you, you don't get aggregation, nor if you delete the, the gene that encodes this protein, suggesting that you can have this kind of conformational replication with just purified protein. This turns out to require the disordered domain. Um, and uh, in fact, the disordered domain is also sufficient for this. Uh, and um, you know, even in the absence of seeding, it can promote oligomerization and condensation. And I, I note that this happens at physiological concentrations. Um, interestingly, they are round, um, but they don't form liquids. They seem to be a, a gel-like structure instead, and clearly not amyloid fibers. What's amazing is that this condensation hyperactivates the, the protein. Okay? And that comes from both better binding to its targets, so we see about a six-fold improvement in dissociation constant, but also a better recruitment of the deadenylase machinery. So many of those uh, proteins have disordered regions within them, um, and they will actually join the gel in the before experiments. And this leads to faster recruitment of deadenylase, or sorry, to faster decay of targets in smog plus cells. I've lost my notes. Okay, so I just tell you that yeah, that's not a long thing. Okay, so with GFP reporters is what was on that, um, you get uh, more degrees. Um, but do they encode information, right? So, you know, transformation is how we would assess that for a piece of DNA. Uh, and so we asked if we take these condensates um, and use them to uh, transform cells where we digest the cell wall, are you able to um, create this trait in the recipient cells? And can it propagate through the lineage, just as would be true for a plasma protein? And I wouldn't show you this if it uh, would not be successful. But basically, uh, you know, what we see is that um, they are capable of encoding the hair information. So this was all about a, a reporter. What if we turn to the real transcription? What we see is a massive downregulation uh, of, of targets, okay? um, as you would expect if you're activating this um, de degradation machinery. Um, and what's happening here is that uh, in the naive uh, native fold, uh, you have a lower affinity, about 200 targets. In the assembled state, you keep those, but you also gain about 100 new targets that were just 
didn't have a, a good enough consensus sequence effectively um, to be bound with the, the lower affinity form of the, of the protein. And it turns out those new targets aren't just random. They um, encode a coherent regulatory network that uh, controls two you know, very important traits. So one is carbohydrate metabolism and the other is meiosis. And in particular, it, it controls aspects of carbohydrate metabolism that uh, sort of control whether you're gonna store energy or use it to uh, make a lot of biomass right away. So we asked in competition experiments, um, what happens to cells that harbor um, the aggregate uh, compared to those that don't in, with respect to these phenotypes. So if you mix, uh, again, these genetically identical populations, 50-50, and you know, let them uh, evolve over time, what you find is that the cells harboring the aggregate win. Um, and the selection coefficient that we observe is actually stronger than for most non-essential genes in this organism, given a, a similar type of experiment. So I find that you know, remarkable given that all that's happening here is a change in conformation. For meiosis, we see the opposite phenotype. So um, here, uh, those cells that harbor the element um, slow, the, the progression. And you know, we can link this all uh, to particular targets within the, the regulatory network. But I think what's like fascinating here is that in this organism and in many others, the decision about whether to you know, proliferate rapidly by mitosis or instead differentiate by meiosis into a stress resistant form is regulated by nutrient availability. And what's happening in cells that uh, harbor the prion is that they're making this decision point more stringent. Um, and yeah, there are costs, of course, to adopting either uh, strategy inappropriately, right? Um, and you, know, you may want to benefit, I think, in theory, there's been some work on this, um, from the experience of your ancestors. Right? So, um, for example, right, yeah, adaptive prediction like this it would be beneficial if starvation would repeatedly be followed by nutrient repletion. Um, but you need to know that information you know, from many generations ago. Um, and you know, we, we noted that you know, this is exactly what happens in laboratory husbandry, right? You grow your cells, they deplete their nutrients, and you're gonna come back on, on Monday, at least in normal times, uh, and you know, subculture them into to fresh meat again. And indeed, you know, poor meiosis is common in, in yeast, right? uh, particularly in the laboratory strain BY that many of us use. Um, and you know, what we noted was that after a transient chaperone inhibition, so the same trick we used to eliminate prions, uh, they became very good at meiosis by comparison. This was true in you know in strains from labs around the world and all of the libraries that exist, and in fact, in many fungi isolated from nature. So we can use the, the magic of yeast genetics to show this really came from um, this particular element. And I just you know, comment here, right, that um, you know, there is in isolates from the guts of bees, from soil, sake, palm trees, you name it, um, we can find evidence for this element existing. Uh, telling us that it's not simply an artifact of laboratory cultivation. But you know, it's even more complicated than that because um, if you notice in that, uh, uh, phylogeny, the yellow nodes had a different shade. And it turns out that that's because the degree of um, transfer uh, degradation we saw varied a lot. And you know, initially I thought that was because of the genetic variation right between the different isolates of, of yeast. Um, but it is also true that these assembly uh, reactions can have a lot of conformation of diversity within them. We sometimes call these polymorphs or strains. Um, and once you form one such aggregate that propagates in that way uh, in the future. Right? So you can almost think of this just how you have allelic variation in, in gene sequence. This is confirmational variation right, of the um, self templating state. And so we wondered, uh, returning to our uh, lysate seeding experiments, if we could see evidence for different assembly properties when we do repeated rounds of, of, um, of, of seeded assembly. Right? And uh, indeed, we do. Uh, and it, it turns out that uh, not only that, the sort of kinetics and the size of the assemblies that are formed has a strong correlation with the amount of uh, repression that, that we observe, suggesting that this kind of conformational polymorphism may exist uh, in nature. And indeed, it's I think, you know, provocative to think about this kind of assembly 
um, having this type of um, you know, allelic variation encoded in the genome. So we think that much more is likely hidden in plain sight, right? So those red cells and those white cells obviously behave very differently, but many of the omics technologies you would use um, to, to go after it you know, would not tell you why. You know, the human orthologs of these proteins have similar disorder domains and assembly properties. There are many proteins that have now been discovered right, that have this capacity. Um, and the question is really, do they do so in nature? Um, and yeah, I just uh, want to plug a little bit yeah, that uh, I think they do, and um, they can do fascinating things. So yeah, for example, you know, we found a, a mechanism now uh, you know, for the inheritance of activated chromatin by considering this, um, and it leads to you know, expression of, of cryptic variation that's accumulated in sub to the mirror regions. But I, I just want to leave you with one final piece of data that um, it takes advantage of the fact that prions are, are enriched in gene control proteins um, to look for an, uh, evidence of their uh, impress of their presence uh, in transcriptional profiling. So if you take the um, natural isolates of, of yeast and compare their genotypic similarity to their transcriptome similarity, um, yeah, you see all of this line crossing, right? Because the, the, the transcription is not uh, driven entirely by uh, are perfectly uh, predicted by uh, changes in, in the gene, which more with the um, But what happens if we play our trick and we use the transient chaperone inhibition to you know, reset the protein folding environment? Um, and again, ask many generations later, you know, uh, you know, how has this relationship changed? What we see is that uh, the correlation is much, much better. So there's still some line crossing, um, but it, it's far improved. Uh, you know, suggesting that, in fact, you know, there may be a lot of uh, you know, aggregates, sort of, if you will, a protein-based epigenetic code that has accumulated in these strains um, based on the life history of their progenitors. And it makes us wonder how much structure in the proteome is really formed tabula rasa and how much might be inherited. So going forward, we're interested in understanding the roles that this type of biology might play in um, development and evolution, where uh, we see actually quite a lot uh, of um, change over evolutionary time and assembly properties, um, as well as contrasting it with scenarios where we think of aggregation as, as being bad. And here we're modeling this in the shortest lived vertebrate that can be bred in captivity, the African turquoise jellyfish. We're also interested in how this kind of self assembly might go awry in the context of disease. So we're screening large libraries of disease alleles. Uh, with Moody Saniot and the Anderson, and have found many examples um, where uh, mutations have huge effects on these kind of emergent properties of protein self assembly. And I just comment that you know, we see cases in which uh, you know, having the mutant allele has a gain of function in terms of condensation, uh, and it's able to recruit the wild type, you know, providing it really a, a mechanism for genetic. Dynamics. Okay. Um, and now I'm back to the spinning wheel. We'll wait a moment, but that's basically the end. You know, I want to thank you guys um, for your attention. But, you know, the summary of this is I think you know, there's value in doing the experiment. Many of our prevailing assumptions about you know, what uh, variants matter, um, and sort of how you know, proteins fold, et cetera, you know, turn out to be you know, an incomplete picture. And I, I think um, they're very excited to understand uh, using these approaches. Yeah, how systems are able to uh, make use of, of variation um, to evolve to meet uh, new demand, or even maybe control this process um, in response to stress. And uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Dan. Forgot to load my audio, my applause track. I usually try and do that because the this is I don't know. To me, this is one of the hard parts of the virtual seminar, right? You finish yeah, yeah. it. There's yeah. not that yeah, audio. It's, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the audio cue. Um, so as Dan said, I, I'm sure he's happy to take some questions. Uh, Dan, are you able to stop sharing yeah, just so I can see, see everyone? Very, something bad is happening. Well, or no. Um, do, there, yeah, I think that seems to. OK. There. I was just thinking that that gives me a bigger <laughs> that I can see a face. Um, and so if, if somebody has a question, you know, feel free to 
uh, you know, turn on your video or unmute or raise your hand or put something in the chat. And, and I see Mo, um, yeah. all of the above. So <laughs> Mo, you want to kick us off? Yeah, that was a great talk. Um, I had two questions about the different parts of your talk. One is in the beginning, you mentioned that polymorphisms that affect the same trait are often spatially close to each other. Do they also have magnitude effects in the same direction? They, they, uh, so we see both examples, but they, they often do. Um, so, it, and there's a little bit of a distinction of for the, if they're in the same gene, they can often have opposite um, effects. And I, one question I have had often is whether um, this reflects kind of like a history of an initial uh, variant overshooting what you want and then um, having modulation of that later. But there's probably a lot more to untangle there. And then the second one was for in species where the germline is separated, do you see different dynamics of chaperone regulation and, you know, therefore like the capacity of prions or protein based mechanisms of inheritance? Does that dynamic be different and separated? Yeah, it's fascinating. So, um, so in um, sperm development in mammals, uh, you know, they're uh, charged with RNAs and turns out also proteins in the epididymis. And um, you know, those are like, the proteins that are loaded are highly enriched in, in having prion like domains. I think very interesting. From the, the chaperone question, um, yeah, I mean, in, in C. elegans, for example, you know, some factor that's secreted from the sperm can lead to you know, loss of aggregates in the oocyte. So if you put a, a poly Q protein, for example, so they can be shown in the, the oocytes, the aggregates will be dissolved by. The, the presence of sperm nearby. So yeah, I think there's oh. very elaborate dynamics um, that would be fascinating to watch. Cool, thank you. Great, right. thanks Mo. Um, um, I, I can go. Daniel, yeah, yeah, um, excellent, excellent job. Um, as far as the conformational polymorphism or even just going to one of these proteins that's able to template a conformation, um, I mean, it's spectacular in that it gives this history um, but obviously environmental circumstances change. And so at what level can it change back? And is that, does that require a chaperone? Um, or can it switch between the polymorphism, the conformational polymorphisms when environmental conditions change? Yeah, it's a great question. So th there's some frequency of spontaneous loss. It's orders of magnitude higher than mutation, but that being said, it's still relatively stable. Um, so, yeah, there are lots of ways that this can happen. We know, you know about inputs that can do it. So GAR, for example, can be erased by desiccation. Um, it, and we understand, you know, less in individual cases. There's still a lot of mechanism to work out. Um, but, you know, for smog, for example, um, you know, when you have really prolonged starvation, you have a reduction in HSP70 levels that would make propagating the element not possible. And in fact, um, work from Nama Barkai has shown if you do what she calls return to growth, so basically starve the cells and then add a ton of nutrient, that is the condition that upregulates the smog protein the most. So it kind of um, creates a, a, a natural example, right, of our um, transient overexpression experiment. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of the, the, the cool part of these elements. Um, you know, if you make mathematical models, is that they're kind of both heritable and reversible. Um, and so, you know, kind of understanding the molecular underpinnings of how that might be controlled I think is a, a really important next step. Cool, thank you. Okay, I'll jump in with a question. Um, great talk. <laughs> Let me start with that. Uh, I had a question about the, um, so the prions, but I actually wanted to go back first to follow up on something you said in response to Mo's question. Um, so the contradictory effects, right? The variance with contradictory. So we've done on a much, much smaller scale, but, but mapping for QTL affecting expression of just one gene and, and found actually like a hundred between a pair of strains, which was much you know, more than, than other studies had described. Yeah. And what it seemed like was that the final resolution we got as recombination was breaking this up, we were just finding counteracting alleles. And I can't remember from your work if you also saw that general pattern. So we definitely, as I was saying, like, especially on the shorter length scale, like we totally, we do see it, right? Um, and so that's the, the main question is like, yeah, again, is that reflecting like an overshoot and then um, like, yeah, trying to, to temper that, right? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, thinking about the the different models of Don't kind of how selection. Ah, oh, sorry, my kids have just come home from <laughs> no, we're about to have large scale disruption. So I'll do my best to wrap up quickly. Jacob, excuse me one minute. Um, and I, again, I apologize if I missed this in the talk from a different disruption that happened here. But uh, when you have the prions, right? So you, you've introduced a, a prion sort of fresh to a cell, and it's causing the ch conformational changes in other proteins. Um, what other mo measurable molecular phenotypes at the transcription level or something else are happening in those cells? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, again, because many of these proteins are controlling either transcription or the stability of messages, yeah, we see lots and lots of, and that's sort of what we used as our, our record at the end, right, um, to look for it. Um, yeah, so they can, can be large, right? Um, and and that, that is correlated, right, with um, phenotypic change that um, yeah, also can be extraordinary. Great, thank you. Um, I know you've got some kids of your own, so maybe you understand that my brain just got pulled yes. in your actions. Oh, yes. So um, it, uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Because my brain stopped. Uh, let me relocate too, that will help. <laughs> you can't break your own rule, Mom. Okay, then maybe I'll just say, um, please join me in thanking Dan for, for the time and for sharing his fantastic science with us. Uh, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, it was a blast. I look forward to meeting with the rest of you. Thanks again, Dan. Bye.